And so all of these books I've chosen have a, just a specific, strong voice of the writer in a style which appealed to me and made me remember them. And my first book is called Double in the Details, Scenes from an Obsessive Girlhood by Jennifer Trey. And in the 1980s, Jennifer Trey was a teenager growing up in California, but banished the thoughts of sunny days spent surfing at the beach because she suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder. And her days were spent disinfecting her hands, clothes, backpacks, and furniture. It was a condition barely understood by the experts and not at all by her parents or even herself. My father and I were in the laundry room and we were having a crisis. It was the strangest thing, but I couldn't stop crying. And there were a few other weird things. I was wearing a yarmulke and a nightgown, for one, and then there were my hands, red and raw, and wrapped in plastic bags. My lip was split. There were paper towels under my feet. And weirdest of all, everything I owned seemed to be in the washing machine. Whites and colors, clothes and shoes, barrettes and backpacks, all jumbled together. Huh. Huh, my father said, examining the Reebok, Esprit, Hello Kitty, Stu, turning through permanent press. You want to tell me what happened here? Wasn't it obvious? The fumes from the bacon my sister had microwaved for dessert had tainted everything I owned, so now it all had to be washed. But this sort of rational explanation hadn't been going over well with my father lately. I scrambled to think of another, turning lies over in my mouth. It was homework, an experiment. It was performance art, a high concept piece protesting the consumerization of tweens. I glanced up at my father and down at the machine, then dragged my baggy wrist under my nose and exhaled. I don't know. We didn't know. Many years later, we would learn that what happened was a strange condition called scrupulosity, a hyper-religious form of obsessive compulsive disorder. It hit me when I was 12, like me off and on through my teens, making every day a surprising and mortifying adventure. Like all of us memoirists, Trey looks back on her life with an unflinching eye. She is willing to share even the most painful details, but she does it with a humor and compassion for herself and those around her. I would say, like the memoirs slash essays of David Sedaris and Augustine Burroughs, or enjoy Rhoda Jansen's Mennonite in a Little Black Dress, then this book is for you. Also has the young adult sticker, the teen sticker, but ignore it because we used to have a copy of adult as well, it just fell apart. My second book is Truck, A Love Story by Michael Perry. Now, when I find a book extolling the beauty of small town Midwestern life, I'm always ready to give it a try. In this delightful memoir, Michael Perry describes a year of his life in rural Wisconsin with the understated writing style you would expect from a northerner. The truck in his title is a decrepit 1951 L120 international pickup, and its history and repairs are woven into Perry's life as he muses on a variety of topics, including growing vegetables, writing, and falling in love. I think it would interest readers of Garrison Keillor or Barbara King Solver's Animal Vegetable Miracle. Now my next books end up going together, and they are the Speckled Monster, A Historical Tale of Battling Smallpox by Jennifer Lee Carroll. And The Ghost Man, the story of London's most terrifying epidemic and how it changed science, cities, and the modern world by Stephen Johnson. And you might be thinking, really? Smallpox, cholera, two books on disease? That's some fun reading. But there is a fascinating, albeit slightly gruesome, quality to these tales. They are both page turners as the individuals within them struggle through unknown territory to conquer two of the greatest killers of their times. 
But there are also two very different approaches to writing, especially to nonfiction writing. Stephen Johnson is a compelling storyteller, but he stays close to the facts that he is able to find in his research. And boy, those are enough, because London of 1854 was one of the first modern cities with a population of more than two million people when the cholera epidemic hit. At this time, people mostly believe that cholera was transmitted by the miasma of unsanitary spaces, in other words, through poisoned air. And two very different men, Dr. John Snow and the Reverend Harry Whitehead, strove to prove that the disease was transmitted, as we know now, by contaminated water. Jennifer Carroll's book centers around the efforts of two people as well. Lady Mary Worley Montague of London and Dr. Zabiel Boylston of Boston, who battled to introduce smallpox inoculations. Now, as she describes their quest, she gets a little more than a little creative. And she states in the introduction that she's going to go ahead and do this with this nonfiction book, so watch out. In honor of Lady Mary's love of a well-told story, I have done my best to live dry and briefly outline scenes back into drama, relying on evidence from elsewhere to add details of sight, smell, sound, food, clothing, furniture, medical beliefs, and scientific facts, movie, poetry, music, poetry, even weather. Where history reports dialogue indirectly or leaves it merely suggested, I have returned it to its full conversational life. She's writing a novel, basically, but she's calling it nonfiction. She's a very, very creative nonfiction writer. And I think that um, that's what sort of fascinated me about these two books together. Frankly, she drove me a little nuts, because there's only so far I think you can go with the nonfiction narrative before you should just write your novel instead. Um, but it's fascinating to think about the style of writing and why do people write the way they do, and it got me thinking about these two books, especially because this book was pressed into my hands by an avid fiction reader who said, you have to read this, it's so riveting. And I realized that for her, this novelistic approach was fabulous. She loved this book. It drove me crazy. So you can try it. Decide which camp you fall into. Now, 1861, The Civil War Awakening by Adam Goodhart. And this is no dry as dust history book. In fact, I enjoy this book so much, it is the only book on my list, fiction or nonfiction, that has not yet stood the test of time with me. It was published in 2011. And Goodhart explores the events leading up to the US Civil War with a knack for choosing just the right quote or the perfect image to illustrate his points. For example, he describes the wide awakes, a Republican marching club, which had thousands of members stretching from New England to the Midwest. They were organized into companies and battalions, and they marched at night, dressed in shiny oilskin capes, gleaming in the lights of the torches they held. They went silently, eyes fixed straight ahead, the only sound the beating of drums and the tramp of boot heels. The author brings this era to life so beautifully, I started to suspect that he's a time traveler who lived through it. Um, and he examines, he also examines why the Civil War came to be. Why, as he says, one person at a time, millions of Americans decided in 1861, as their grandparents had in 1776, that it was worth risking everything, their lives and fortunes, on their country. He shows a time of upheaval, of division, of bitterly fought wars of words, and the invective that he finds in the newspapers of the time still brings out harsh and uncompromising and painful to hear even after all these years. It's a fascinating glimpse into a period of history that's often overlooked as historians leap forward to the Civil War itself. It's a, it's a must for anyone who enjoys David McCullough's work or Doris Kearns Goodwin, especially her book Team of Rivals, which explored Lincoln's particular Lives Like Loaded Guns, Emily Dickinson and Her Family's Views by Lindell Gordon. Approximately the first half of this book is a biography of Emily Dickinson's life. I would almost say a standard biography, 
But this Emily is not the waifish, shy poet wafting about Amherst in a white gown, although the author does include three fascinating reproductions showing how the one known image of Emily Dickinson has been doctored over time from the severe hairstyle and uncompromising gaze of the original to an image with a fluffy lace ruffle collar and lightly curling hair. Now, the Emily Dickinson of this book is indeed reclusive because of an unspecified illness, which Gordon suggests was epilepsy. She was sensitive, especially to bright lights, which kept her inside, where she could control her environment. But Gordon makes it clear that Dickinson was a person to be reckoned with, wielding her sharp tongue and utilizing her keen brain, in short, acting exactly as one would suspect the writer of the following words to act. She dealt her words like pretty, excuse me, I can't misquote Dick Dickinson. She dealt her pretty words like blades, how glittering they shone, and every one unbared a nerve or wantoned with a bow. Now, despite her unusually reclusive life, Emily was not a solitary person. She wrote letters, she shared her poems with a favored few, and she had strong bonds with her family. Even after her parents died, she lived with her sister Lavinia in the family home. And her brother lived right next door with his wife, Susan, who was Emily's best friend. But this was not the peaceful family life it seemed from the surface. Not least because starting in 1883, Emily's 54-year-old brother Austin started a 12-year-old affair with the 27-year-old Mabel Loomis Todd. Their trysting place, Emily and Lavinia's home. A typical for a biography, the second half of the book takes place after Emily's death. And the heart of this half of the story is of Emily's work and the feud that ensues as Mabel Loomis Todd and Austin Dickinson's lover and Emily's sister Lavinia fight to be the executor and the interpreter of Emily's writing. And my last book, as we finish up, is not a book that would go well with any discussion that I can think of, but it's called Reading the OED, One Man, One Year, 21,730 pages by Emma Shea. And I think anyone who loves the English language will adore this book. The author takes a year to read the 1989 edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, also known as the OED. The OED is a 20 volume work which weighs in at 137.72 pounds and defines 231,100 main entries Words. Although defining words is not the OED's main purpose, it is a historical dictionary tracing the path of words, uh, tracing it through three million quotations from a variety of sources from classical literature to film scripts and cookery books. And he offers a gently humorous account of the tribulations and triumphs he encounters as he completes this massive endeavor of reading this huge thing in a year along with some of the best words he found as he went through it. And he also, charmingly enough, ends up reading it in the basement of a library. So what, what more can I like about this guy? Um, if you like this book, uh, this is uh, similar, I think, to Simon Winchester's books on the same subject, The Professor and the Madman, A Tale of Murder and Sanity and the Making of the Oxford English Dictionary and the meaning of everything, the story of the Oxford English Dictionary. Or if you just like people who do wacky things like reading the OED, you could try The Know-It-All, One Man's Humble Quest to Become the Smartest Person in the World by A.J. Jacobs, in which the author reads the entire Encyclopedia of